All right. Today we're going to look at an investment example. This is going to be one of our first investment examples, so it's going to have some simplifications to it, especially when we're computing the risk of the investment. Later on, we're going to see a more complicated measure of risk when we do portfolio optimization. But in brief, here's the story of the problem. So let's say we have $100,000 available to invest. We narrow down our investment choices to these five investments. For each of them, we have estimated return percentages, let's say over a year. And we're going to assess their risk with a risk score. So the higher this number is, the riskier the investment is. Now, to avoid putting too much money into one basket, we're going to add uh, a few constraints to this problem to force ourselves to spread the money around. So these are the A, B, C, D. First one says the average risk score per dollar invested is at the most five. So this is going to work like a weighted average type of constraint, right? So when you put money in the first investment, that money comes in with a risk level three. The more money you put in there, the more weight you're giving to this number three here, right? Um, so overall, on average, considering the amounts that go into each investment and their respective risks, when you take that average, you don't want the risk per dollar to be more than five. Um, then at least 20% of the money into the commercial loans, no more than half into the two types of mortgages, first and second, and the amount invested into second and personal loans combined should not exceed the amount invested into first mortgages. So in class, we went through the mathematical model for this more slowly and in more detail. Here, I'm going to assume we have gone through that. If not, I'm going to be posting a video uh, of that later. But let me go to Excel now, where I have the model written down. So essentially, the unknowns in this problem are how much money to put into each investment. Right? These are the numbers we're looking for. The numbers we're looking for become variables. That's why we created five X variables, X1 through X5, how much to invest in each of the five investments in that order listed in the table. So we want to maximize the return. So the return is essentially the amount in each investment times its return. Add that through all investments. We only have $100,000 available. So if you add up the X's, that's how much you invest in total. That can't exceed 100000 so we're considering our x variables in thousands of dollars. That's why I just have a hundred here instead of a hundred thousand. This is the weighted average constraint. Imagine that this total amount invested here that's in parentheses is on the other side dividing this expression, right? So if I take each amount invested times its risk and divide this whole expression here by the total amount invested, which is this quantity here, that gives me the average risk per dollar, right? The standard weighted average calculation. But that would have been a nonlinear constraint because it would have had a division by variables. Well, it's very easy to transform that into a linear constraint by simply multiplying both sides of that inequality by the denominator, which was this expression here. So this expression disappears from the denominator on the left side and appears multiplying the number five, which was the maximum risk we were accepting um, on the right hand side. And now it's linearized in the sense that I only have variables multiplied by numbers. I don't have variables with exponents different from one and none of that. Okay, so it Mathematically speaking, it represents the same weighted average calculation, but now it's in a linear form that allows a solver to use the linear programming solver, the simplex solver, and guarantees it will find an optimal solution. The next constraints said that I did not want right more than, or I wanted at least 20% of all the money invested that's why I'm adding the X's here, to be in the fourth investment. 
And the first two investments, the two mortgages, can be at the most half of all the money. And the amount invested into the second and third investment can't exceed what you invest in the first. Notice that if you stare at this problem for a while, you might be able to deduce that you will indeed invest all of the money, which means you could rewrite this constraint to make it an equality. And if you do that, you could go back and wherever you see the sum of all the investments, you could replace that with the number 100 because you know you're going to invest all the 100. However, were this a more complex problem with a more complex collection of restrictions on how you invest, it could be that you're not going to be able to use all of the money. So the safer way to really model this is to not assume any of this and just give the model all the freedom it can have. Notice that saying less than or equal to 100 still includes the equality, right? If the model feels like using the whole 100 is the right way to go, it will use it. But if not, it will use whatever it can and therefore, these expressions here will reflect appropriately how much money was indeed used. So, writing it this way, even though we know we could have replaced all of these by 100, writing it this way and practicing writing it this way allows you to write a more generic model that would work in other situations as well. That is to say, when you don't use all the money. All right? Great. So, let's take this and put it in Excel and find a solution. All right, if you remember from our earlier videos, Excel needs one cell to represent each variable you have. So I'm going to have my five X variables here in row five, and I highlighted them in gray. And the rest of the data, right? I typed in the, the returns for every investment and the risks. So we just have to write now down here the constraints in the objective formula. Recall for each constraint, three cells. One for the formula on the left, one for the symbol, one for the formula on the right. The symbols aren't really necessary, but they're good for us humans to open the spreadsheet a week from now, look at it, and understand what's going on. All right, so let's begin with the money available, right? It's basically the sum of all x is at most 100. Well, the at most 100 I already have here. So on that side, I just need the sum of all x's, okay? which I can do this way. Notice that this expression gets used in other places, here, here, and here. So when I'm writing those formulas, instead of writing sum of all x's one more time, I could simply point to this cell here, B18, to save time. It's not necessary, but it helps. All right, so in row 18, I implemented in Excel this first constraint, the money available constraint. So now let's go to constraint A. A says the following. What's on the left? It's every investment multiplied by its corresponding risk. Well, this is a number times variable plus number times variable, etc. constraint or formula. And this can be accomplished with our friend some product, because this is what some product was meant to do. Take a bunch of numbers, comma, a bunch of variables, and you do first times first plus second times second plus third times third, etc. And that's what this expression here wants. On the right hand side, what does it have? It has a number five the maximum acceptable risk, times the sum of all x's. So I can do equal, 5 times, sum of all x's. Well, that's my B18, right? Or if you wanted, you could just type sum, parenthesis, all x's. Great. B. B says, on the left, I just have the fourth investment. Well, the fourth investment here is cell D5. On the right-hand side, we have 20% of the sum of all investments. So 0 0.2 times 
sum of all investments, right? Constraint C. On the left, I have the first two investments added together. So first two investments. On the right, we have one half times, again, the sum of all investments. Well, that sum is here. And constraint D, we have the following. On the left, we have the second and third investments. Second plus third. On the right, we have just the first investment. So notice, what you do in Excel is simply mimic, right? Replicate what your math is doing. So that's why you should always first write down the math. All the thinking goes in here. Going from here to the formulas is really a mapping operation, right? Because there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. Everything that's in the math will have its counterpart in these formulas here. Great. The last thing we need is the return formula. But what is that? It's over here, right? Every investment multiplied by its corresponding return and add them all up. Again, it's another one of those number variable plus number variable plus number variable, right? Another sum product. Take all the variables comma numbers and of course it doesn't matter if you put first the numbers comma the variables or vice versa because right two times three is equal to three times two it's a commutative property so here we go now what we want is to ask solver hey find me the best values to put into these gray cells in row five so that i maximize the value in cell C20. Let's do that. So click on Solver. So the objective cell is where the objective formula is, and that is C20. So we click that there. This is a maximized problem, so the default is correct. Changing variable cells, it's Solver asking us where are the variables. So we select that gray range. And for constraints, you click the Add button. Let's see here. Um, the first constraint is the money, right? So money used in B14 at the most. I'm sorry, no. This is constraint A. So this is the left-hand side of the weighted average formula for the risk. That's in B14. Less than or equal to that right-hand side. With the five times sum of all x's. The next one is constraint B, right? Money in the fourth investment, that's in B15, greater than or equal to, change the symbol, 20% of all the money, that's in D15. Now the next three, which includes constraint CD plus the money available, notice that they all have the same symbol. I could do them individually like I was doing the first two, but to make life easier, I can also do it this way. I can say solver. And again, this is only okay because they all have the same symbol and they're stacked on top of each other like this. I can say solver. I would like these three cells, right? B16 through 18, to be less than or equal to, of course, you know, pairwise, to the three cells in D16 through D18, right? So doing it in a block like this is also allowed. And that will be the end of constraints. And our variables are non-negative, so cl click this box. And we change the solving method. It's not a non-linear problem, it's a linear problem. So the LP, simplex linear programming, that's what we choose. And now we can click solve. So, as we predicted, you can see we did use all the money, the 100 here. And the way we did it was like this. So 40,000 in X1, 40,000 in X3, and 20,000 in X4. 
Notice our average risk per dollar was 4.8. We were willing to accept a 5. And this is what happened with the other constraints. This wasn't tight. This was tight. This was also tight. All right. Total return is 11.2. Um, percent, right? Or if you're looking at a hundred million or a hundred thousand, I believe there's a mistake here because I think in the problem I mentioned a hundred thousand. Is that right? Yes. So when it says million here, it should actually say thousands. So this is basically saying we invested a hundred thousand dollars and got back um, 11.2 thousand in return. So it's an 11.2 percent return here in this case. All right. So this is our first investment problem. I hope it helps you understand it a little bit better and replicate what we did in the classroom. See you in the next video. Bye bye.